you too can carve a beautiful wooden spoon just like this one with this exciting wrapped copper handle. To do it, I'm going to use basswood. Now this is a traditional carving wood. It's very light and the grain is not too distinct and it's soft and easy for carving. I'm going to be using traditional carving tools and I will begin by striking a line down the center of my carving piece. I happen to have this bench cookie that is just the right size for the width of my stock and I'll use it to create a circle. I'm not looking for a perfect circle, I'm just looking for a nice round shape that I can use to create a bowl for my spoon that has an elegant yet practical shape. And working off that shape, I'll begin to sketch my handle. And I'm only going to concern myself with one half of the handle, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Now it's off to the bandsaw. I have a 3 8 inch wood blade on my bandsaw, and I'm going to work with that to find the natural arc that it wants to cut that will keep me close to the lines that I have drawn on my stock. I'll let the wood feed into the blade and not force the blade into the wood. And then I'll just turn the stock gradually as I feed it through the line, following that line as is practical. When I get to that sharp turn, I'll just stop there and back off and create a new graceful arc that feeds into the line of the handle. I'm going to turn as sharply as the blade will allow me and then follow the line down the length of the handle as straight and as gracefully as I can. Bringing my piece back into the bright light over at my bench top. This is why I only concerned myself with one half of the handle when I was sketching it out. I'm going to use this section that I just cut away as a template to give me a mirror image from the first side that I've already cut. And I'll just need to add in that little accent where the handle meets the bowl. And I'll sketch that gauging from the other side as close as I can. Then it's back to the bandsaw to trim this other side as well as the detail of those two accents where the handle meets the bowl. If you don't have a bandsaw, this is something that you can do with a coping saw or any other saw that you feel will be able to get you as close as possible to the curves that you have drawn. The shape of your spoon is up to you, and how you would like to cut out that shape is also up to you. You might just use a scroll saw, or even a handheld jigsaw. Once I've nibbled off these two accents here at the handle, I'll show you yet another use for the two pieces of wood that we've already cut off this blank. We're going to begin to carve the bowl of our spoon, and these two cutoffs will help us secure the piece on the bench top using a couple pieces of scrap wood and our bench vise. Next I'm going to sketch out the rough shape of the bowl of my spoon, giving myself about a 1 8 inch margin where the bowl meets the rim and the edge of the spoon. I'm going to use this gouge. It's a 7 forward slash 35. The 7 refers to the degree of arc on this 35 millimeter wide blade. And as you can see, this matches the shape and contour of my bowl pretty precisely. I'm not even going to need the mallet using this gouge because it's very sharp. This wood is soft and it carves easily just by pushing it through the wood. I've choked up with one hand down on the blade and the other on the handle. And this gives me all the control I need as to where I begin the cut how I push the blade into the wood and how I change the angle of that cut to create a nice sweeping bowl. I just do this by lowering the handle and because this blade has an outside bevel it allows me to create a nice smooth curved cut. And as I push this blade through the wood I'm learning 
where the resistance is and where it cuts smoothly and where it might be tearing. This is learning the grain of my piece of wood. This is learning how to work with that wood. And it goes pretty quickly. You can see that it is cut smoothly across the grain and tended to tear out along with the grain. So keep that in mind as I make this second pass going deeper and trying, of course, to make smoother cuts as I get close to the point where I'll consider this bowl finished. Both the feel and the sound of the blade cutting through the wood give you an indication as to how smooth your cut is going. Just listen as I cut out this next piece and you'll be able to hear what I'm talking about. Now, the piece of stock that I'm working with is nearly one inch thick. So I have a long way to go, and I want a pretty deep bowl on my spoon. But this is something you need to be mindful of as you carve, because you don't want to carve right through the bottom of your stock. And you don't want to let the sides of your gouge dig in, the corners, the tips because they'll make deep lines that may be too deep for you to get out uh, with the depth that you want to cut to. Now this is looking pretty good, and it's plenty deep enough for an ordinary spoon. But I do want to go a little deeper, and I'm going to use this curved gouge that will give me the ability to spoon out even a deeper bowl with some nice graceful cuts. And you can see how the sweeping shape of this curved gouge allows me to control the sweeping shape on the sides of the bowl of my spoon. It gives me a lot of delicate control as I cut deeper into this stock. And you can see that now I'm not cutting so deep. I'm refining the shape of the bull more than digging deeper and deeper into this wood. I think I'm getting pretty close to my final depths, and that's something I'm about to check. But first I'm going to use the broader blade on my other gouge to smooth out some of these sharp and narrow scallops that I got when uh, using the curved gouge. My concentration now is on smoothing out the shape of the bowl so that there'll be less work when it comes time to use the scraper or sandpaper. And notice that I've tried to preserve the full margin that I allowed myself between the edge of the bowl and the outside edge of the spoon. This is important because as we work to smooth out the bowl, we'll be nibbling away at that margin, and we don't want to go beyond it. I'll show you why later. Notice how I rotate the blade of my gouge in the dead center and bottom of the bowl, because that's where I was getting tear out when I pushed along the grain, and I don't want any at this point. I want a nice, smooth cut. And rotating the blade, allows it to cut across the grain instead of pushing out through the grain and getting more tear out. Okay, it's looking pretty smooth and I'm going to use a scraper just to check the symmetry of my bowl, uh, see if I've got the right and left sides similar. Now you can use a scraper here to smooth out the inside of the bowl even further, but don't worry if you don't have one, you can use sandpaper. 
and I think that's what I'm going to do. Before we go any further, we're going to sketch out the depth of the bowl, and I'm gauging it here just with the pencil tip. You can see we're pretty close to the bottom. We have about an eighth of an inch. And now I'm going to sketch out the shape of the inside of the bowl as well as the shape that I want to leave for the outside bottom edge of that bowl. I do this by continually turning the spoon so that I can refer to the shape. And I'm showing with this line pretty closely how much wood I want to take away from this piece of stock and where my handle will be. This will be the most narrow part of the handle. You can see we can still remove a lot of wood from around the bowl. The front, the back that curves into the handle, as well as both sides. Now I'm going to bring this line across to the other side and sketch out as close as possible the same pattern on this opposite side. Getting an accurate representation of the inside of your bowl is most important because you don't want to cut through it. And yes, this is a hatchet. It's not a specialty carving hatchet, but I do keep a pretty good blade on it. It's very sharp. And I'm going to use this, as I've seen others do, to hog off some of the wood that I won't be needing on this spoon. I'm choked way up. In fact, I'm holding the blade and not the handle. Because I've never done this before. And I want full control, as much control as possible. And I'm learning as you watch what I think I can get away with as I remove a lot of wood from the handle area of this spoon. So this is a learning opportunity for you and me both. And I'm getting a feel for this wood and the way my hatchet works along the grain, against the grain, and with the grain. I'm being extremely cautious simply because I've never done this before. And I'm not even certain that I'm going to go much further using this method. But uh, I'm going to continue, at least for a little while, and see how things play out. But we never know unless we try. I just don't always take my first try on video. Just listen to the sound of that. It's a dull thud and not nearly the cutting sound that we were getting in the other direction. This is a little sped up, but basically I'm applying the same technique, chopping into it for a relief cut and then scraping away to remove some wood. I'm going to go a little longer here, but I'm getting pretty nervous about breaking the handle or cutting too far into the handle. I'm getting a little bit of a feel for how this blade is cutting into the wood and how the wood responds, both when I cut with the grain and against it. But watch what happens here. See how the wood is splitting even in advance of where I push the blade right there? That's making me really nervous. So I think I'm going to continue this with my knife and whittle away uh, the bulk of this wood. Not that I'm immune to making mistakes when I am using my knife, but I can make them a lot slower. And yes, there's a lot of stock left yet to uh, remove, and it's going to take a while. But I'm going to look at it as a learning opportunity. And I suggest that in this situation you do too because you're learning this piece of wood. You're learning the grain and how to work with it and not fight against it. So when you have a lot of wood to remove, take that time as a learning opportunity and get familiar with your piece of wood. It'll help you later when you get into more delicate areas where even the tiniest uh, little bit of overcut will end up being too much. And you might notice that as I cut along the grain in one direction, uh, the wood will tend to split and peel off. 
and uh, it follows the grain of this piece of wood that you can't really see because the grain is very indistinct in uh, this wood, but it's still there, and it, it still can contribute to uh, an accidental cut where you remove too much. So it's a learning opportunity, and you have to be aware of what the wood is trying to teach you. So even with my knife, uh, being this is the first time I've worked with this variety of wood, I'm moving slowly and apprehensively, taking my time and trying not to make any mistakes that I can't recover from. The farther you get along into any project or piece that you're working on, uh, it might just be the, the more likelihood of there is a making mistakes because you're getting into uh, you know more delicate areas but it's also when you don't want to make a mistake and lose all the time that you've already invested so I don't want to rush things and uh, get clumsy and I appreciate the fact that you might not want to sit there and watch me take every piece of wood off of this stock splinter by splinter so we're gonna watch it at a higher rate as I whittle away and try to get uh, down to the final shape of this spoon and we'll move it ahead but I'll make certain to include any parts that uh, I feel would be a value and a good learning experience for you and there's always more than one way to do a thing of course so you can go at this any way you think best you might want to use a, a spoke shave on the handle or even a uh, bench top belt sander as I demonstrated in a previous video. What I'm doing is demonstrating one way that I've done it uh, so if there happens to be anything in that that uh, you can learn from that you can take that away but you can do this uh, whatever way feels best for you and what feels best to you might just be the way you should do it because this is meant to be an enjoyable pastime, uh, a hobby that gives you pleasure and not frustration. The spoon's bowl is going to be a round graceful shape so yes there's a lot of wood yet to remove from uh, the sides but remember we have a very narrow margin for error along the bottom as there's only one eighth inch of wood uh, between the bottom on the outside and the inside bottom of the bowl. And yes, it looks like my supervisor has arrived to uh, check on progress, but she's also uh, late for her afternoon nap. Okay, I've been at it for about 30 minutes, uh, of which I've spared you, and you can see uh, we're getting to a refined shape for the spoon, so here on out, I'm using very little pressure on my blade, removing very thin slivers of wood because it would be too easy here to uh, push hard and let the blade dig into the grain and tear out a big chunk of wood that would go too deep, uh, you know, requiring me to remove too much wood, especially here at this narrow part where the neck of the handle meets the bowl. And I'm going to take this opportunity to define where these accents at the end of the bowl come into the handle and I'm going to carve away some more material here because I want a, a deeper crevice and more definition between where this round shape of the bowl ends at the handle. I'll cut these grooves in now with the blade of the knife make them a little deeper and then I'll soften these shapes uh, later on with some sandpaper and if symmetry is what you're looking for and it is what I'm looking for in this spoon. Now's the time to even up the, you know, one side from the other. In other words, try to get both sides looking identical. Now, as I was talking right there, look what happened. Uh, the blade dug into the grain and took out a deeper shaving than I intended. And look at how deep it is there. I'm going to try to remove some material until that hole is gone. But look how much I have to take away. A little bit deeper and that could have spelled trouble. It's not about removing bulk right now, it's about refining 
the final shape of my spoon. The handle, the neck, the bowl, the detail at the uh, edge of the neck and the bowl. And so I'm going to move slowly, remove as much as I dare, and attempt to get a good symmetry to the spoon and the handle, all the time referencing one side off the other, and listening to the wood, and letting the wood guide me. You can see how this ridge will fall into the center once both sides are even, so that's something I keep my eye on. That ridge will let me know when both sides are indeed even. Speaking again to the fact that there always is more than one way to accomplish anything, we could be completing the rest of this shaping of the spoon with sandpaper. Make no mistake about it, an 80 grit abrasive will work just like a carving tool and remove a lot of material fast. You decide, again, what feels best for you. I'm going to spend a, a little more time on the detail with my knife, but soon I'm going to move into some 80 grit abrasive to smooth things out and we're heading for the home stretch now. Our spoon is looking pretty good and soon we'll be working on the copper accents for the handle. Just a little bit deeper on the definition here where the bowl turns into the handle. And I'll just take a little bit of time to make sure both sides are the same. Now you might want a more rustic or rugged look to your spoon where some of the carving marks remain and if so this is just about finished for you. I'm going to smooth this out down to a 320 grit abrasive so I want a very smooth surface on my spoon. But right now I'm concerned with the final shape, the roundness, the thickness of the bowl, the strength of the handle, but it's looking pretty nice. For sanding, we'll begin with an 80 grit abrasive. Like I said, this is a pretty significant tool for taking away material, so use it with care. You can certainly change the shape uh, quickly and go beyond what you might have intended, so keep looking, keep turning the spoon, rocking it back and forth, uh, referencing one side against the other, but you can move along pretty quickly with this 80 grit paper. And as you work along the graceful sweep of the handle, the neck, and the bowl, remember, we've folded this sandpaper over three times, and so as you bend it, you get a nice graceful curve, and you can use that to your advantage, relaxing or tightening that curve as you go along where needed. Uh, it'll give you a much smoother surface than you might have imagined. If you look closely you can see the darker areas that the sandpaper uh, hasn't contacted yet and these are the recesses that you need to sand down to. And remember I'm going for symmetry in my design so whatever I remove from one side I'm going to remove from the opposite side, so I'm going to continue to turn the spoon back and forth and reference that. And just like when I was using the knife, I'm going to keep this ridge in mind, and the more I can keep it centered, the more that is an indication that both sides are equal. And you can still see some dark spots uh, that are low spots that the paper hasn't contacted, Watch how quickly the abrasive will take us down to that level. It doesn't take long. Now the thickness of the abrasive in this tri-fold configuration allows me to kind of cup it within my fingers or the palm of my hand and let that relaxed curve work around the bowl of the spoon for a nice smooth shape permitting me to give the bull 
a round shape without any facets or flat spots. Now here's a trick. You can use a tennis ball. I have one here. I don't know what the three X's indicate. And I place the bowl of the spoon right over the ball. And that keeps the edge of the bowl up off the work surface. It raises it above the work surface and allows me to sand right up to it and beyond. It also makes it very easy to rotate the bowl uh, from side to side and back and forth as I sand to help me keep the shape nice and round without creating any flat spots. Now as we have refined the shape of the spoon, look what's happened to the margin between the inside of the bowl and the outside rim of the spoon. It's very close right there. And we don't want to go beyond it because if we do, the shape of the spoon, the top, will actually angle down towards the tip. It won't be flat. The more we take away beyond that line, the deeper that dip will be. And now we're moving to 100 grit abrasive. And make no mistake, 100 grit will still remove a lot of material fast. If you look at the bottom or the crown of the bowl as we see it now, you can still see a little bit of a flat spot right there. That's all that remains from the original flat side of the piece of wood that we started with. And it's a good sign at this point because remember, that thickness at that point was only about one eighth of an inch. So as we shape the bottom of the spoon, we don't want to take too much material away from that point. And just look how nice the bowl is looking. We're getting a, a very even margin around the rim, and that's something that we are certainly striving for as that margin for error gets closer and closer. So keep referencing it and pay attention as we move forward. I'm going to work with this 100 grit sandpaper and complete the final shape of the bowl at this point, uh, constantly referencing that margin of error between the inside of the bowl and the outside rim, so that I know that I'm as far as I can go, and I don't want to go any further. Look how smooth and regular it's starting to appear. And I'm going to apply that same level of attention as I finish up the final shape of the handle as well. And the tennis ball helps me here too to keep the handle raised above the work surface as I shape uh, up to and around the edge, giving it a nice rounded shape. Now we'll move on to a finer 220 grit abrasive. This won't remove so much material, but we can still do some final shaping and some of the more detailed areas. I want to pay attention to the rim. I want to make sure it's nice and rounded without taking uh, hardly any material away. I just want to round the edges. And then in here in the detail where the bull connects to the neck, I want to make sure that these shapes are graceful and rounded and flow seamlessly from one to another. Okay, we've gone from 80 grit to 100 grit to 220. And the spoon's looking pretty elegant, smooth and refined. Still a little bit of work to do, but we're moving right along. I think it looks great. It might be hard to see because the grain in this wood is not so pronounced, but look at that detail right there. Once we oil it up, it will uh, stand out a little bit more, as well as the grain in the bowl. And it looks pretty good. As wooden spoons go, you could take some 320 grit to this now and refine it. But we're going to go and apply that wound copper handle. So I'm taking a measurement right here, the width of my hand. And I think that's a pretty good average. And I'll sketch out where I want to wind the copper. I'm also going to shave a little of the material of the wood off the sides uh, where it meets the edges there so that the wound copper will be flush. I'm going to begin then by cutting a stop into the wood. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep at first because you can always go deep later but you, you can't undo something. And this is the handle. I don't want to lose any strength or integrity. And then I'm just going to cut up to that stop. 
not too deep, pretty shallow at first, where I can create a wall, a sharp edge. Remember, as I wind the copper around this handle, I want it to rest in, in that recess and be pretty much flush with the part of the handle that is not going to be covered with the copper. And now, as I see that I need it, I can cut that groove in a little deeper and then shave up to it more, making a nice gradual curve from the center of the handle toward the recess where the wire will lay. I'll continue cleaning up this edge and then shaving a more gradual curve from the center of the handle into that recess. And once I achieve a, a smooth, graceful curve on this end, I'll repeat the same technique on the other end at the top of the handle. I'm not using a lot of pressure on my blade here. Just a nice, subtle shaving uh, to remove material because this is a soft wood. And if I hit that edge uh, that I've cut, even as deep as it is, if I hit that with a lot of pressure, it could split right down the length of the handle. Now right here is where I'm going to coil the wire as a stop. So once I insert the wire through the handle, it can't continue to pull through. In other words, I'll insert it from one end, coil it for a stop, and it'll come through to the back where I'll begin wrapping it. And I'm going to repeat now what I did uh, lower on the handle here at the top. There'll be a coil where the wire can come out and stop, and I'll cut a recess in Nice and softly, I'll shave a contour into the handle at the top. Well, look who's back. That wasn't very much of a nap. I hope she approves of what we've done so far. But I have to get back to work. Now, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm getting a little bit of tail interference here as I carve, and I don't want to shave off any of that glorious tail. So let me see if I can negotiate with my supervisor and get a little more room to work. Okay, I'll continue to refine uh, these areas where I'll be covering the handle of the spoon with wound copper wire and I'll make the shavings as smooth as I can with a knife before I move on to the abrasive again because the wire will be wrapped tightly and will transfer or show uh, any unevenness in the shape uh, that you'll be able to see even after the wire is wrapped around it. Okay, I'll take my knife and make a little indentation right where I need to drill. And then using a 1 16th inch bit, I'm going to drill a hole from the center of the front to the back. I want the wire to lay deeper within this recess uh, where it goes through the handle because when I bring it around I don't want a double layer of wrapping. I want to be able to have a nice flat and even wrap. So I'm going to cut a trench in there and as you see on the front here we shave some recesses in where the coiled wire uh, that acts as a stop will be. I'm using 12 gauge round bare copper wire. And it's important that you purchase wire that is intended for uh, use, you know, with crafts or jewelry and not necessarily electrical wire because 
That may come from China and it may have cadmium in it. We want 100% pure copper wire. I'm bending the end over uh, as a beginning point and then I'll grab that end with the nose of the pliers and turn it to begin to create the coil of wire that will act as a decorative stop on the front of the spoon. Then it's a matter of pulling it through tight and beginning my wrap pushing the wire always toward the wall of the edge that I've cut in. And then as I continue to wrap it, always putting pressure to keep the next wrap of wire tightly against the previous wrap of wire. This is something that you could adjust for later, but it's easier to do it now and wrap it very tightly one against the other. This can be a lot of work and it takes some strength and it might just be the most strenuous part of this project. But it pays to wrap it tightly, as tightly as you can. If you have a roll of copper wire, feed directly off that roll. Don't cut a piece. Uh, if you do cut a piece, don't cheat yourself and don't scrimp because it can take as much as one foot of wire for each half inch of the handle that you're going to wrap depending on the diameter of your handle. In other words, this piece here was about 12 feet long and I didn't end up with any to spare. Now it's just a matter of feeding the remaining length of copper through the hole from the back to the front, pulling it tight without breaking the handle and then begin your coil that is a stop so the wire cannot go back through the hole. Wrap it tightly and then because the hammer on this hatchet has a nice flat surface I'm using it to tap down the copper especially in the coils and give them a nice rounded shape so they will conform to the contour of the handle. And now I'm sanding the entire thing with a light abrasive. I'm here with the 220 grit abrasive and I'll probably go to something even finer like a 320 to give it a nice even and uniform look. So I'm finishing off the spoon with the 320 and making certain everything is smooth and shaped perfectly. Look how nice our spoon is looking. You can see the grain, how it plays in the bowl there. And once we oil this, that will have a little more definition. The edges of the bowl, the lip, are nice and rounded and smooth. And right there, where the bowl meets the neck, is a nice flat area that if you wanted to, you could engrave an initial of the person to whom you will gift the spoon. It's looking pretty good. Front and back. And now, let's get some oil on it. We're going to use mineral oil. It's a food grade oil. And we'll just pour a little in the bowl. And you'll be able to see immediately that it helps to give the slightest bit of color and definition to this wood, bringing out some of the grain. That's looking pretty nice. We'll be certain to wipe the oil thoroughly along the length of the handle and the spoon, uh, right over top of the wound copper so that the oil gets down in between the winding. This oil will help to seal the wood and protect it. And now we're finished. We've created a really beautiful spoon of distinction. A little bit steampunk, but very unique. This is something that you can certainly do, and it makes a wonderful gift. Thank you for watching.